Welcome, class, to Mrs. Leland's Explain Everything. All right, I'm not going to explain everything. I'm just going to explain bacteria. and Well, I'm not even going to explain everything about bacteria, but enough for us um, for this part of your learning journey. Today, when we get done with this PowerPoint and when you are done with your assignment, which you should have out right now, it's section 20.2, Prokaryotics. Uh, you should be able to explain the characteristics of bacteria. You need to include how they cause harm and how they are necessary, and explain why bacteria are so successful. I want to remind you that at any point during this presentation, the pause button and the rewind button are available for your convenience, so use them as you see necessary. Our first question for today is the true-false question, which is, True or false, most bacteria are harmful. When you hear about bacteria on the news, when you think about bacteria, if you were to come up to someone and talk to them about bacteria, what is it that they would say, that they were harmful or that they were beneficial? I'm going to give you a moment to pause. When you're ready, push play. The actual answer is false. Most bacteria are actually good for you. And we're going to focus most of our time on that today, which was um, one of our aims for the day, is to look at how they're necessary. But we all we do have some bacteria that are harmful, although it's not that many. We'll also talk a little bit about those as well. Okay, what everyone does not know is this is probably about the seventh time that I've tried this slide. I um, This time you're going to get what you get. We're going to go back and look at what we talked about on our first assignment, which was about prokaryotic versus eukaryotic cells. And we just spent a bunch of time talking about eukaryotic cells, right? Plants and animal cells. And now I want you to go back and think about prokaryotic cells, specifically bacteria. If you need to go back to your first assignment because you can't answer this question, please do so. Uh, the question is, bacteria contain all of the following except Genetic material, nucleus, cell membrane, ribosomes, and a cell, cell wall or cytoplasm. Like I said, if you can't answer this question, I want you to go back and look at your first assignment, find that picture that we drew, and make sure that you can answer it correctly. Well, the correct answer is that bacteria do not contain a nucleus. So they have genetic material, and that's in the form of DNA, and I've been trying to write that word down on this explain everything. I've been extremely unsuccessful, so we will not be writing that down at the moment. A cell membrane, ribosome, cell wall, and cytoplasm are all parts of a um, bacteria. The other thing that's not listed is the cytoskeleton, which you will find on that first assignment that we discussed. Bacteria are really actually pretty cool. We're going to look at structure and function of bacteria. We're going to look at some examples of how they differ in shape. This is a good um, picture to show that. Over here you can see the bacilli or rod shape bacteria. This one's called Pseudomonas and you'll notice that it has a rod shape. We have these coccus bacteria. This is Staphylococcus. Um, they are round shaped bacteria. Um, and we also have bacteria which are really interesting, which are called spirilia or spiral-shaped bacteria. You don't really need to necessarily memorize that. It's just interesting to know that bacteria do get their name based on their shape. Okay, if you're in my class, you should be on the first page of section 20.2. It says, in class, general characteristics of prokaryotes. You're going to cross off prokaryotes and you're going to write characteristics of bacteria because what I'm going to tell you is that bacteria are prokaryotic and they're single cell meaning they're made out of one cell. So that should be the first thing you're writing down. The second thing I want you to write down is that they have cell walls. We also know that plants have cell walls. The difference between a bacteria and a plant has to do with the nucleus. Some bacteria have something called a capsule and a capsule surrounds the bacteria. You can actually see the capsule right here. It's that stuff in yellow. And it protects and attaches. It's kind of sticky. So when you walk around and you touch a desk after somebody sneezed, there's snot all over it. The capsules from the bacteria would stick to your hands. So I suggest when you are done today, you wash your hands and don't pick your nose. Some of these bacteria 
uh, not all bacteria, but some have something called flagella. And flagella are long whip-like extensions that are used for movement. This right here is not well organized. That has to do with the transition between the PowerPoint and explain everything, but I think we got this under control. So flagella, right here, these long whip-like structures. Okay, we also find them in sperm cells, but they're used for movement. We also have something called pili. Okay, and pili are short bristles that are used for attachment. Both of these are found, like I said, on top of that capsule right here, this capsid. Here are our pili, right here and right here. And they are also used to help attach those bacteria um, so that they can stick to surfaces that they, that they need to. All right, if you're in my class, you should be turning to the second page where you have this particular picture of a bacteria cell. We're going to go over the following structures that you should have identified in your reading. The first one, letter A, is this long whip-like structure, which we just talked about in the last slide. And we said that those were called flagella. Uh, the flagella are usually used for movement, and they work best in watery environments. Letter B are these round structures that are tiny and scattered throughout the bacterium. We also have them in humans. We use them to synthesize or make proteins by stringing amino acids together. They're called ribosomes. And we just talked about those in the last unit about how important they are because um, they uh, make proteins and proteins do all the work of a cell, whether it be a bacteria cell or a eukaryotic cell. Letter C there are all these thread-like um, project thread-like structures that are found inside of this bacteria cell and those would be part of our cytoskeleton. We talked about cytoskeleton and its importance in maintaining shape in different types of cells and we're going to identify that in this particular bacteria picture. Letter D happens to be these projections that are shorter than the flagella that are sticking outside of the bacteria and we said earlier that those were pili. They help for attachment. Letter E is this dense region of noodles in the middle that give directions. It's the control center of the cell, even though it is not really a nucleus, it's our DNA. Um, so that would be our DNA, and it's actually DNA. Later we'll talk about viruses and how it can be DNA or RNA, but for a bacteria, um, it is actually DNA. That is the instructions on how to make proteins that are carried out by the ribosome. Letter F is this structure right here, okay, that the pili are attached to. That would be our capsid. Capsid. Letter G, which is just inside the capsid. So it's this layer right here inside the capsid, right? along the inside edge there. That would be our cell wall. And our last one that we're going to look at is H. And H happens to be, nope, sorry, we have two left. H is right inside the cell wall. And just like in plant cells, that's going to be our cell membrane. So cell membrane. And letter I is that fluid that is inside of our bacterium. And that is going to be our cytoplasm. Cytoplasm. And before we talked about the different things that all cells have in common, one of the things that we listed were that they all have ribosomes, right? So both prokaryotic and eukaryotic have ribosomes. They both, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, have cytoskeleton. Both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have DNA, whether they're a plant or an animal. Uh, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells have a cell membrane whether you're plant or animal, and both prokaryotic and eukaryotic have, a, have cytoplasm. We um, talked before about how cell walls apply to plants and bacteria, prokaryotic cells, but not to animal cells. If you are curious about this structure here that I did not actually have you um, label, but you can see there's a box here to label it, 
That is actually um, something called a plasmid, and we'll talk more about that in genetic engineering. It's kind of interesting we use those to um, insert DNA that we want the bacteria to read. So if we want a bacteria to make human insulin, we'd stick a human insulin gene in there and make the bacteria become a human insulin farmer, and that would be um, what the bacteria would start to do for us. All right, the next part of our assignment that we're going to skip down to, so there was part about structure and function, about how they differ in size and shape and movement. We've kind of discussed a little bit of that already on your assignment sheet, right? So um, we talked about cocci versus bacilli, rod shapes, spiral shapes. We talked about movement, right, with the pili and the flagella. So that part of your assignment should be filled out based on what we talked about before. If you need to push pause to take a moment to look up above, you can do that. Uh, nutrition and metabolism, we're going to talk about in um, just a little minute. We're going to actually skip down to growth, reproduction, and recombination. And um, this right here is a petri dish that actually has different types of bacteria growing. When we look at our petri dishes later from our hand washing lab, we're going to look to see if we have this type of diversity um, you'll see all the different types of bacteria that are growing on this petri dish and on the next class period we will actually look at ours and see if we have this kind of diversity on our skin cells or not. Okay, like I said earlier, we should be under the growth, reproduction, and recombination section. So reproduction for bacteria. They reproduce using something called binary fission and binary fission is asexual reproduction, meaning one parent so we have a parent cell, so here is my parent cell, we call them parent cells, I would probably label it as a parent cell, and it takes its DNA, so this parent cell has some DNA, and it makes a copy. So here you see two copies, the bacteria then will pinch into two, and it will form two identical copies, or two identical cells. These are called daughter cells, so binary fission Asexual reproduction, one parent, one cell pinches into two cells that are identical. So parents look just like their daughter cells, right? Parent cells right here, daughter cells down on the bottom, and they're identical. It will probably really be helpful for you to pause right now and actually draw a picture of binary fission. So write the word and draw a picture. It'll help your brain remember it later when you find it on the test. Okay, so if we look on the first page, um, one of the vocab words is endospores. This also should be written done, down underneath growth, reproduction, and recombination, right next to that picture that you just drew of binary fission. We have something called an endospore, and an endospore is a uh, dormant form of a bacteria that allows it to survive in harsh conditions. So when a bacteria no longer has available food sources or water sources or the temperature is too hot or too cold, it will take and make this right here down on the bottom where I'm drawing the red line is a protective coat where the nucleus becomes protected and essentially the bacteria goes into hibernation. And it waits until the conditions are, are favorable for it to actually start growing again. So it's no longer growing, it's just in a state of hibernation. The next thing um, that I want you to uh, write down and learn about is something called conjugation. And conjugation is extremely interesting. Bacteria asexually reproduce, right? So one bacteria is identical to um, its parent. So a parent has two identical offspring, but bacteria have a lot of genetic diversity, and that's because they swap their DNA. And um, one bacteria will share its DNA with another. So when we look at this picture over here, what we see are two bacteria. They're not related to each other. Okay, well, this bacteria is going to get close to this bacteria. And this bacteria right here has a plasmid or a piece of DNA. It's kind of like chewing gum. They get really, really close, and this bacteria over here decides to give this bacteria some of its gum. So now I have two bacteria that, um, one looks a lot different than it did before, and when this happens a lot, we get lots of different types of um, genetic material in there. We don't have any offspring being created, so there was no offspring, but there was the sharing that was going on that allows for some diversity. 
It might also be helpful for you to pause right now and draw a picture of this, um, but that's called conjugation, where one bacteria snuggles up next to another and they share genetic information with one another and um, they don't make any offspring, right? We started out with two bacteria, we end with two bacteria, it's just that now they have more genetic differences, they have more, they have different DNA. Alright, next we're going to talk about the importance of uh, bacteria. And when you look on the bottom of your sheet, that'll say the importance of prokaryotic cells after the growth, reproduction, and recombination. And we're going to look at the roles that prokaryotics play in the living world. You're going to need to list at least four. You guys are going to watch a video that's going to talk a lot about different ways, but you for sure need to be solid in at least four. This picture right here is showing some examples. We're going to talk about some of those in our next slide. All right, going back to the true-false question. Um, most bacteria are actually really good. And we have bacteria on our skin that is not harmful, and it actually takes up space so that the bad bacteria cannot live there. In fact, we are outnumbered 10 to 1. Uh, there are 10 bacteria cells living in your body or on your body for every one of your cells. So obviously your cells are bigger, but number-wise, they have us. And it actually ends up being a good thing for us. can kind of think about it like a neighborhood. So if I have a neighborhood and all my houses are filled, every single house is filled with really nice, friendly neighbors. All right? And they take care of their lawns and they shovel their driveways and they plant flowers and they have kids and they're all very nice and friendly and all these houses are full, I'm going to stop drawing here, then there's no space for the riffraff to move in. If we become obsessed with um, cleaning our hands way too much, using way too much hand sanitizer, and we start making it so that some of these houses and some of these neighbors start to move out. So this group right here of neighbors decided, you know what? Um, you just shoved me out of my neighborhood. So I was a good neighbor, and now I'm leaving. That opens up niche space or space for bad neighbors to move in, neighbors that aren't going to take care of your yard, neighbors that, if they are bacteria, are going to actually try to consume and eat your skin or do other harmful things, which we're going to talk about in a minute. All right, besides taking up and being good neighbors, right, space on your um, skin, and being friendly to your skin. We also use them a lot in food production to make things like cheese and bread and beer. Um, lactobacillus, I'm sure you've heard of, is found in yogurt products. Um, that's the picture that you see below. We also use bacteria to make things like insulin. I talked about that earlier with that plasmid that um, was on that picture. So humans have actually inserted DNA on how to make human insulin. So it's a sequence of DNA that says, here are the instructions on how to put together an insulin protein. We've inserted those instructions into bacteria and those bacteria read those directions and they manufacture the insulin protein. So if you're diabetic, the insulin injections that you get were actually made from bacteria. If you were to look at it under the microscope, it would be exactly the same as um, the protein found in people who make their own insulin. It's just that we're making the bacteria do the work. We also can use these bacteria to clean up environmental messes. So um, a lot of times um, scientists now are looking at different ways of having bacteria break down oil and um, other things. And right here, this picture that I didn't mention, I guess, is what the bacteria actually look like that do make human insulin. So this is an actual picture of bacteria that um, are being used to make human insulin. All right, great. So bacteria can do great things. They can also do harmful things, and that tends to be what we talk about most, or what we hear about most, I guess. Um, and if you go to your next page on your assignment, um, yes, so it says, how do bacteria cause harm? So here are your answers. The first one is that they can metabolize, right? So they can metabolize their host, their host meaning whatever they infect. So it could be humans, it could be your dog, it could be any type of organism, um, and they use us for energy. So they actually break your cells down and use you for energy. 
you're its food source. That's really not a good thing. That's why you want to keep a neighborhood full of good neighbors and not evict a bunch of good neighbors where bad neighbors, the type that actually want to, um, you know, eat your skin, move in and take over. So there is such a thing as over hand sanitizing your hands. And when I get back to class, we'll talk about that a little bit, especially when we look at our hand washing lab. Um, also, besides using you for um, food source, bacteria can produce toxins. So these are chemicals that damage cells. And why would a bacteria produce toxins? And the reason is really it's their survival mechanism. So if they feel like they're being under attack or they're afraid that something is going to come and kill them, their way of protecting themselves is to produce poisons to kill the organisms around them that would otherwise cause them harm. That can create problems for us. A good example of, of toxins with bacteria is tetanus. And most of you probably remember getting a tetanus shot. You should be getting one every 10 years. Um, it's a vaccine. We're going to spend more time talking about vaccines with our next, um, our next subject next time, which will be viruses. That's your homework for tonight. Um, but tetanus is a... The problem with tet tetanus is this, this bacteria produces a toxin that stays in the soil or it stays in the ground, it stays in the environment, and when it gets into um, your skin through either rips or tears or rusty nails or skin punctures, um, it can create some serious problems for individuals. One of those problems that we see, or the problem of tetanus, I guess is what I should say, is that um, you actually get individuals who get a lot of rigidity and it breaks down, um, it, it causes your muscle tissues to seize up. So you can't move anymore. It's extremely painful and something that you really um, don't want to be exposed to. So please make sure that you're up to date on your tetanus, tetanus vaccine. And like I said, we'll talk more about that on uh, tomorrow. So what are ways that we use to try to control these harmful bacteria? That would be a really good question. We have some harmful ones. What do we do to protect ourselves? The most common thing that we use to protect ourselves are antibiotics. Um, like I said, we'll talk about vaccines later. Um, so vaccines tomorrow. Um, if you're not in my class, I'm sorry, you probably aren't going to get the vaccine talk. But um, this is on the next, the last part of your assignment, right? So we use, one of the ways we use it are vaccines. So I want you to write that down. Talk more about those tomorrow, but we use antibiotics. Antibiotics are chemicals. And they kill bacteria. And they specialize in bacteria. They affect cell walls. You and I don't have a cell wall, but we can attack a cell wall and a bacteria. They also do things with ribosomes in bacteria. Um, ribosomes in bacteria are a little different than eukaryotic ribosomes. We try to plug them up and do different things. You guys are going to watch a video in a minute about um, how bacteria have become um, antibiotic resistance. Okay, so antibiotics can stop working on a bacteria. The video is a TED-Ed video on antibiotic resistance that you're going to watch. And some of it has to do with that conjugation where bacteria uh, share genetic information. And if one bacteria makes an extra strong cell wall or a ribosome that's a little different, our antibiotic drugs are no longer um, able to work on those um, bacteria. So uh, sometimes, like I said, uh, swapping of genetic information, selection pressures, picking only the bacteria, you know, we kill off all the bacteria that have weak cell walls, and the only ones that are left are the ones with the strong walls. And then our new population of bacteria have strong cell walls, and our antibiotics can't work anymore, which is why it's really important not to be taking antibiotics when you don't need to be taking antibiotics. For example, if you have a virus, and we're going to spend more time talking about viruses, like I said, tomorrow. This slide does a really good job of showing you what I mean when I talk about drug resistance and this conjugation or swapping of genetic material. So I have a bacteria, usually we call them like super bacteria, and they have special powers and um, it is able to resist either because it makes a stronger cell wall or it makes different ribosomes that are not affected by the antibiotics. And we give 
this entire group here antibiotics and maybe this one dies. This one starts to have lots of offspring. I should probably change my color. Right, it has offspring. Its offspring start mingling with the other population, right? So it starts sharing its genetic information. And the ones that it's not sharing its genetic information with, so these over here, die. But then all of a sudden we end up with all of these new bacteria that have the super genetic variation. We've effectively killed off the ones that the antibiotic used to work on. What we're left with are these um, thriving bacteria that antibiotics don't work against anymore. Um, now I'm going to have you talk to your neighbor. And make sure you can answer our AIM questions for today, right? Those were the ones that I showed you at the beginning. They're on the top of your worksheet. Um, characteristics of bacteria, how they cause harm, how they're necessary, how they're helpful, what they do that's good for us, right? Most bacteria are friends. Um, and there's different ways that they're successful. And part of that was from your reading assignment. I didn't really talk about them necessarily in your notes, but they are in your reading assignment. I want you to go back, look at it with your neighbor. I want you to make a Venn diagram comparing prokaryotics versus eukaryotics. I'm looking at structures just to sort of do a little bit of a review because we will be having a test. And I also would like you to make sure that your true-false question has examples to support your an answer, okay? So we, I told you guys the answer, right? It's false. Bacteria are, most bacteria are good. Um, like 99.9% .9 of all bacteria are actually helpful. And when the question says to give examples to support your answer, I don't want you just to write down yogurt. I want you to explain. I want you to tell me examples. I want you to demonstrate your knowledge um, and share everything that you've learned. So I feel like the um, what may be 20 minutes for you, I'm not sure yet, but it's been an hour and a half for me to put this presentation together has been worth my time and that you are far more well-educated at this moment than you were uh, 20 minutes ago of listening to me drowned on and on. But like I said, just be happy knowing that I have been doing this for an hour and a half to two hours. And however many minutes, I'm guessing 20, that you had to suffer through, maybe 25, um, I suffered longer. So, no, I'm just kidding. Actually, it was good. Um, make sure if you have any questions, you write them down so that I can um, help you tomorrow. I have no idea how this turned out. You'll have to let me know tomorrow because I refuse to um, listen to myself talk. Uh, like I said, make sure you fill out that true-false question and see you later.